Lord, the word of prayer, and we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you so much for uh, giving us the thirst and desire to know you and know your word. And we thank you so much for those who have gone before us to provide us these resources so that we may learn and be, become greater disciples of you, that you may, we may have Jesus more fully and the faith in, in our hearts grow more stronger. And ask that you just guide our time tonight, open our hearts and our minds as we learn about you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So tonight, um, we only have three commandments to go through. We're going to finish out the Ten Commandments tonight. So we're moving right along. We're, we're right on time. Um, so we could have, since we only have three commandments, if we want to have more discussion, we can. Um, we're not boogieing through. As, we're not making up for two weeks like we did last week. So hopefully we won't be as, uh, we won't keep you as long. Um, so we're moving right through. We're, we're on the seventh commandment, thou shalt not steal. Um, so what does this mean? It seems simple, but it's, we'll, we'll look at it anyway. It says we should fear and love God so that we do not take our neighbor's money or possessions or get them in any dishonest way, but help him to improve and protect his possessions and income. So these next three command, these next few commandments are going to be a little focused more on the we're prior, if you notice the structure of the commandments, the first two commandments deal with how do we interact with God. The next three commandments inter deal with how do we interact with our families, with authority, and with uh, violent crime, like the, the effects on people's lives. The last few commandments are going to deal with primarily possessions and des the desiring of, of possessions. And so, there, so when we look at this, when we do not do not steal, as Christians, we look. We rejoice in and look after the earthly goods that God has given us and our neighbor for the support of daily life. What's interest about, interesting about this is early, one of the first heresies of the church was Gnosticism. And it came from this idea of the secret knowledge, Gnosis, that people thought it was an influence of, of Greek philosophy into the Christian thought. And it tried to separate the spiritual and the physical. So this idea that everything spiritual mattered and the physical didn't. And it went so far as to take it into attacking the very humanity and divinity, the humanity of Christ. And it caused a lot of problems and led into the Arian heresy and so forth and so forth. And we can get into that later. We'll probably deal with that a little more when we just talk about the creeds. When we get into the Apostles' Creed. But what a tendency is for Christians will have two, end up in two extremes. Whether either we despise earthly wealth to the extent that we force ourselves into poverty foolishly, we don't steward our, 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 our possessions well, or we go to the ex other extreme of your possessions are reflective of your spiritual state. That you, if, you have, if you're wealthy, then therefore you are in, in great standing before God. And so we have this dichotomy between the two. Of these two extremes, and as one of our uh, the founders of my me and see, Ashley's uh, alma mater says, we have to rest in the center of biblical tension. It's a very uncomfortable place to be. We don't go to. We want to rest in the center of biblical tension. You don't want to go to the extremes. The tendency when we're reading the scriptures or reading theology is to go to an extreme. We either go straight, extremely to the point where. Everything, every the Bible is. We have to take the Bible completely, one hundred percent literally. We have, it's a manual for living, and all these things. And we every single word we have to do perfectly, or we can go to the extreme of oh, it's just a really nice collection of stories. No, neither of those extremes are accurate. There's a there's a center of biblical tension where we can we deal with Scripture in its context, culturally, historically, literary, uh, the literary genre, all that matters in how we interpret Scripture. Same thing with possessions. We can have to rest in the center of biblical tension. Where we don't go to the extreme that, oh, if I'm wealthy, I'm okay with God, which we saw a lot, and you see that a lot in the gospel accounts, where Jesus is encountering these people that say, when he says, it's, it's easier for, the, for a man to pass through the eye of a needle, a camel to pass through the eye of a needle, than a rich man to pass through the kingdom of heaven. And the apostles are floored. Wait, wait what? Because they've been told their whole life, wealth equals good status before the Lord. That's not true. But at the other extreme, we don't want to assume that, oh, you, you can't have all these nice things. You see this pre frequently after, with the rise of monasticism, after, the, uh, after Christianity becomes the, 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 the religion of the land, you start to see this tendency towards uh, asceticism, to where we're going to give all our goods away, we're going to live up take on vows of poverty, we'll never have wealth. And that was a sign, supposed to be a sign of extreme piety. 
it can be is that, that I'm not we don't that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to that it's not a good thing to give things away but we don't want to go to the extreme that we are bad stewards of what we have I have some friends of mine who only recently they're in their 50s they only recently started saving up money for retirement putting them in positions mm -hmm. To, sit, to, to prepare themselves for later on and save money because they believe, well, if I have extra, I need to give it away. I, I, don't ha I just live day to day and, and, and build a bill. And they, and they made some rather foolish decisions as a result of that. Now, if you're, if you're, if you're like at myself, you get in situations where hey, I'm living paycheck to paycheck and that's just because the way, <laughs> not because we've been foolish, but because the, the money just hasn't worked out that way. But, uh, and we've only started to dig ourselves out of that. But there's a difference between that being like genuine poverty and people who say, well, I'm just going to be foolish because the material don't matter. And that's not, that's, there's that, that dichotomy of the two. And so this, these, this commandment here, it's not just about don't take what's not yours. It's about being good stewards and help your neighbor be a good steward of what they have. So this is, the, so when we look at this commandment, when we, see, we, can, we, we, we can rejoice in the goods that we have. Like that central thought, as Christians we rejoice in and look after the earthly goods that God has given us and our neighbor for the support of daily life. God gives us good things, and that's okay. It's okay to have a lot of good things. It's just the things don't need to be the focus of your life. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when we look at this, so earthly goods and money and possessions are important because these are gifts by which God provides for ours and our neighbor's needs and the enjoyment of life. I mean, it, it, it seems like it's pretty common sense to think that, but in, in theological circles and Christian circles, it can, it can, you can struggle a little bit with that when you consider when, when you have to when you consider teachings of like Jesus saying, well, if, if someone asks you for your coat, give them your shirt also, and things like that. It's, it's, the point is, is that God has given each, each of us blessings and given us things to be stewards of, and we have to be good stewards of that, and then we also need to help our neighbors be good stewards. So, like, if someone's hurting for money, it's not just enough to give them 20 bucks, but if it's a friend and say, hey, I can't pay my, my water bill this week, you should help him pay his water bill because he needs to be able to have water to take care of his family and everything like that. But it's also like, I'll give you some help with your water bill, but let us come alongside you and help you figure out your budget so that this doesn't happen again. You know, when your kid asks you, hey, I can't afford gas money to go, go to work, All right, I'll help you with gas money, but let's look at your budget and see how can I help you be a good steward of what God has given you, rather than I'm just constantly bailing you out, if that makes, if that makes sense. And so, like, God gives us these good things, these gifts, like, God redeems good gifts and the, the steward of the creation that we have, so that we can enjoy them. We can have, it's okay to have an education, it's okay to have a savings and a retirement plan, in fact, it's wise, very prudent, especially as, as the life expectancy gets hot longer and longer, but, you know, retirement comes at 65, in the 60s, yeah, you need to have a plan for how you're going to take care of yourself if you're not going to, if you don't want to work the whole time. So, and you guys know all that. I'm not going to preach another the choir there. So how do we fear and love God in keeping the seventh commandment? We do so by not taking God's earthly gifts from our neighbor in such ways as stealing our neighbor's possessions and money, being lazy or sloppy when working as employees. That's a big, that's one you don't, most, most people don't think about when they come to this commandment. But like, being a lazy employee, well, I'm not hurting anyone. I'm just not doing my full work, but it doesn't hurt anybody. Or you're wasting the employer's time. You're taking their money and their paycheck. They're spent wasting money on you, so you're stealing in that sense. Acquiring goods by dishonesty, fraud, or taking advantage of others. I mean, we can all argue that there's an entire city and district up in between Virginia and Maryland that does that on a good, on a good regular basis. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it can uh, – an example for that, not just – con artist, but I know that um, this is a story I tell occasionally. Um, I came across a supervisor when I was working as a police officer. Who knew me, my wife, he just busted a drug dealer. He had about $5,000 cash on him. And we counted it, we were counting it out on, in front of the camera, and I realized I forgot to turn the camera on. So I had to walk, walk around and turn the, the, the dash camera on. And, I, and he said, he, before, I, before I did it, he said, hey, you need to take a, cut a little bit to help yourself out because I know you and your wife are struggling. It's, it's, drug, the, the, it's all going to go to the department anyway. I still don't know. I was a rookie. I don't know if he was testing me or if he was being legit. But I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm not going to prison for 500 bucks of drug, drug money. 
<laughs> not gonna happen. I don't know, and I still don't know. I mean, not, I, I, he could very well have been testing a brand new rookie who just got cut loose from training. Absolutely, I, that's the, that is what I prefer to think, because I love the man. But, um, but you know, this, it, this idea of dishonesty, of take, even if it's money that was dishonestly gained by the person that I was arresting, it's still dishonest for me to take it in that, se in that sense, you know? And it's a slippery slope, it's a really slippery slope. But we also, in addition to not taking and being dishonest in how we acquire goods, we also fear and love God by looking after our neighbor's well-being and helping him protect our, improve our neighbor's whether earthly possessions, income and livelihood. So not just by helping our neighbor by not taking their money, but also helping our neighbor, oh, you're starting a business? Let me share your Facebook page. Let me, sh let me try and invite people to follow your Facebook page if you're trying to start a small business. Or hey, you know what? I'm gonna send business your way. You got a really good restaurant. I'm gonna go try it out, make sure you know what you're doing. Because I have friends who should not start businesses. They don't know what they're doing. But, and I'll tell them that. <laughs> like, you should try something else. But, you know, being honest with that. But if they know what they're doing, they're doing a good job. Helping them get business. You know, helping them do what they need to do to work. Need to work. If you're, an example would be like, if you're in, fi in the finance world. And you're, you're like, hey, you, you, you're starting a business. Let me help you out by doing your business taxes. Let me help you, help you read your books. Or, um... Things like that, just doing what you can to help each other out, you know? If I find out that, you know, we, I know we have some farmers in the, in the, in the church, you know, if, if I find out you need some extra help on the farm, I am worthless, but I'll come and help if you need it. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll come and help because I want to help you do well, you know? I'm not, I'm not if, you need, if, if you need some help mowing a lawn, I'm again worthless because I have no depth perception and it will look ugly. But I'll at least make sure the grass is trimmed, you know? You help each other out. So it's not just about not taking what's not yours, it's also about helping your neighbors do well and helping them manage what they have so that they can do well and hopefully they're doing the same for you. So it's, 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 this, this commandment is back and forth. And it's, it's, it's also, this doesn't just matter about physical property, it's intellectual property too. Like I, I struggle because I cite other people in my sermons a good bit. Like when I'm researching my sermons, I'm using commentaries that I did not write. And I'm using ideas from commentaries that I did not write. Well, I, it'd be really awkward in the flow of my sermon if I told you I got this from this, and I'm citing this source, it's page 365 of the uh, Africa Bible Commentary. A little awkward, but I at least make it known, hey, if, if you want to know where my sources are, if it's not my idea, I'm going to at least try and say, hey, I read this in a commentary. Hey, Martin Luther said this. You know, this is a general idea. You know, things like that. Or you, I, I, I see... If you, if you follow the Facebook page of the post we've been doing for the daily devotionals, I reference, like, if I'm pulling from a study note of the Lutheran Study Bible, I, I say, this is from the Lutheran Study Bible. This is where I got this idea from. Because intellectual property is just as important. It's just as important to not steal and use. Uh, in Iraq, you, got, you get the, we call them haji copies. It's not politically correct. YouTube, don't cancel us. But um, they were <laughs> the, the bootleg DVDs. Of movies, so like I got to see Iron Man when it was still in theaters. Like I had friends in in, in South Carolina who had not seen Iron Man in 2000, uh, 2008, 2009. I, I saw them. I got a I got a, a bootleg copy to, to where you can actually see the people getting up and moving through the theater because <laughs> we, we there were three bucks in over in Iraq. We it was the way we got our movies. It was a lot easier than get them that way than it was to buy them and have them shipped out there. We didn't bring them back. More than, we were allowed to bring one copy of every movie back. We were allowed to bring like, there, one guy got busted and he brought like, he bought like 50 hot, uh, uh, bootleg DVDs and was trying to ship them back. And I'm like, yeah, 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 that's, you're going to, you get, you're going to, you're going to Met Leavenworth for a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, you, you, stealing that property, making sure you're being a good steward and not trying to cop, take someone else's hard work and not pay them for it. You know, that's important. And, you know, um, so that's, that's, we have to gauge that against what is property today. And, you know, we see here further questions like, how does God provide for us? You know, it says, how does, how does God provide for us and others with our earthly goods? He provides for us through the bounty of the earth, through the vocation of parents and families and neighbors, and our jobs and careers. And, you know, I think, I think part of that, too, is being a good steward of God's creation. There's a lot of talk today about climate, about environmentalism. Is it overblown? Is it not? We don't know who to trust anymore. 
But I think it says it goes without saying for us as Christians that we should be good stewards of the creation God has given us to steward. Like that was the original purpose of humanity. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them, he created Adam specifically with his image to be a priest between creation and God. And God. So humanity was designed to be God's representative to creation and creation's representative to God. We are stewards of the earth. And we're stewards of its resources, and we're stewards of its the creatures that other all the other life that lives here, God put us in charge of. That has been taken to extremes by those who just want to make money. A lot of people, especially in the 19th century, use that idea to justify, well, we can strip mine, we can do whatever we want to do. No, we need to be wise and careful and good stewards of what we do, of, of, our, of the world as we do it. So we need to be careful in the processes that we use to take the, the good of the earth for our benefit. Doesn't mean we need to put the good of the earth ahead of ourselves. There's a balance point. Again, center of biblical tension. How do we rest in tension within the overarching issue and how do we continue our civilization but not, but, it, but at the same time be good stewards of what we've been given? Because at the end of the day, we are stewards of creation. This is God's. God owns this. Everything we have, God owns. My parents taught me that from a very young age. It's not my money. It's God's money. It's, and I'm just taking care of it. We have to be good stewards of it. And a, a good context for me for that is, if, if you're familiar with Lord of the Rings, the steward of Gondor versus the king of Gondor. When the steward's like, you're a steward. You're here to steward the kingdom of the kingdom terms. That is what we as humanity are designed to do. We are to steward the kingdom of earth, of God, until the king returns and takes his throne properly when the resurrection and so we have to be good stewards of it be good stewards for the sake of our family through our vocation to, to taking care of our loving our neighbors and be good stewards of our jobs and careers so we don't get foolish um, and you all know better probably better than my generation does about how to be a steward of your careers <laughs> I, I, I was I was talking about it with my uh, with someone I know real well I can't remember who my, it might have been my dad it might have been someone else but the diff we, were, we were talking about the differences between Y'all's generation, where you stay faithful to a company for 20, 30, 40 years. I haven't worked at the same place longer than three years, I think. Yeah, four years was the longest I spent, and I was in the Army. So I, 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 this is the way the, the life went for me. Is I, I, I will say, I started with the honest good intention of staying 25 years in every position I, I started at. But God led me other ways. But there's a lot. It's very uncommon for someone my age or my, my generation or the generation coming behind me to stay in one place for very long. I don't know why. I really don't know. I don't know if it's a matter of loyalty. It could be just, it could be debated at length, and it's being debated at length. So you're the time to challenge that. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Like I said, y'all don't need to worry about it. I don't say that to scare y'all. Yes, you have to have a we years. <laughs> no, Ashley and I have already discussed. I'm not moving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley, Ashley, Ashley and I have had that conversation. We are here as long as you will have us and as long as the doors are open. So so that is not a concern. I don't say that to put that in perspective. I was more using that as an example. Like, I'm not alone in that. This is a whole generation. I think that, that a lot of the reason people don't uh, uh, stick with jobs and stuff is that the, the compact between the boss the company and the employee is gone everybody is now a subcontractor yeah. or disposable replaceable the other thing is is that when you talk about stealing the, the way we, Alice and I talk about it in our house is that everything we had came from the almighty that doesn't mean that we were blessed in a certain way because of the way we acted and if you take somebody else's stuff you not have not stole I didn't steal from Nancy I stole from God because yeah. God gave Nancy everything she has, and if I take it from, her, and the the uh, the most, in having worked in finance and things like that, the most bitter I get is when I see people take advantage of poor people mm -hmm. in advance. It makes me very, very yeah. bitter and angry because poor people get taken advantage of you know, with financing and loans and. All those type things on a, on a routine basis, and people prey on them. The scammers prey on them, and that is just it. It, it makes me very angry. See, yeah. and there are people that that do that uh, that uh, 
hold themselves out to be very honest people. And then there are just crooks. You yeah. know, there's crooks that go around and, and do things like that. But that's that's always the way I, I've always looked at it. Is that that's what Nancy Hess is Nancy, and the, the Lord gave her that. And if I take that, then uh, now I used to have a neighbor who used to go into his other neighbor's house and take his beer from him without <laughs> asking all the time. He said, "Come over there," and he said. I'd be okay if he took one, but sometimes he takes 10 a day, and I know he's not going to hold back for long. <laughs> well, and it, it's, Over there, up there, we're on the you floor. Know, it, what, you, what you said about possession, you know, there's a, I read a really interesting book on spiritual warfare from a Lutheran pastor. He's up in Canada. Well, he was in Canada. He moved to Africa because he had to leave the persecution up there. But he, he made the comment, you know, people talk about demonic possession and things like that. Like, none of us have possessions. We don't own anything. The demons don't take possession of anything. They steal it for a time. And and so, or and in our cases, we steward it. God has given it to us to steward, but we don't own it. You know, that's one of the reasons why I keep stressing. Like, I always, I always get really antsy when I hear a pastor say, well, my ministry. My ministry is this. I'm like, no. Like, that's one of the reasons, like, from the beginning I got here, I'm like, this isn't mine. I, I steward this. This is me stewarding Christ's ministry, and I'm just taking, trying to make sure I don't screw it up. Um, to be a good steward. And so, you know, when you really start to think about, well, I don't have possessions. I'm stewarding God's possessions that he's given me as his gifts to enjoy, absolutely to enjoy. It doesn't mean, it's not like when you're renting a house and you're like, okay, I don't want to make sure I, I can't fully enjoy the house for fear of, you know, I'm renting it if it's a belong to someone else. But you can, you can still enjoy it, but taking care of it. And so you, you're right. We don't possess anything. And, um, and I, I, I agree with you. I get the, the one group of people that makes me most angry that take advantage are these prosperity preachers. I would I would love to go to toss some temple tables. I would love to walk into some places like Joel's Seed Church and just toss some temple ta ta tables and, and just say, "What are you doing? This you're you're fleecing people in the name of Christ. Not just not just fleecing people. You're, that's bad enough, but you're fleecing people in the name of Christ. Like that's just ugh. It makes me angry." If you really want to get angry, go back and read some newspapers about Jim Baker. He was down there. Oh, I remember Jim Baker. Oh, oh, yeah. It's yeah. unbelievable. An unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Just the files or, or, that he pulled. Or uh, the, the uh, Murdoch trial yeah. down in South Carolina. I have some friends that were affected by that. Mm -hmm. That were genuinely, that were victims of that, of his police yeah. and his, 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 his awful, awful behavior. But, um, yes ma'am. I just wanted to comment on uh, what Greg had said. When he was talking about people not exactly job hot coming mm -hmm. to stop yeah. and all that stuff, it used to be a badge of honor for you to work for a company for years and years. It was like a gold watch, mm -hmm. you know. And then they started some places they started with pension, and then back when Nixon was in office, they started getting people up to a certain level, and if you only had a few years left, you got fired. Because they didn't get the pension. They didn't have to put in pension. You didn't have to pay that pension into a fund like you do now. And, and it's just like, well, why should I stay here? I, if I stay until I'm 60 years old and then I get fired, what have I accomplished? Yeah. And a lot of people said, no, not me, not again. Yeah, and that's, 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 that's how it is. I know I read a story about Amazon. Like Amazon will hire a factory, the, the workers for the line to help process the shipping and everything mm -hmm. in the shipping centers. And I've read stories about how they'll, they, they tell you there's going to be upward movement, but they know after three to five years they're going to let you go. They're not going to promote you. There's no, there is no room for improvement. In fact, you can't just stay in that position. They're going to let you go in three to five years because Jeff Bezos has said he doesn't believe – he believes that an employee's worth – or, or, or crop pro, uh, production goes down after three to five years. And so they're just like, okay, go away. And they treat him like – they treat him very terrible. Treat him terribly. I mean, even the military treats him terrible. Like we, when we were in, when Ashley was serving, there were guys that had 18 years, two years from retirement, and they took, they got out rather than reenlist. Like 18 years, you're this close to federal retirement, yeah. and you just you take you take a discharge because they're treating you so poorly because it's just atrocious. And it, so it's 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 important, I think, in this in this context, and this isn't in the text here, to be good bosses. To be good stewards as bosses, to take care of your people, and to be good leaders as much as it is to be good, uh, be good employees, and be good, good with the resources we have. But um, that's great discussion. But um, so when we so we talk about how we 
how, the last question here is how should we use our own earthly goods? We are to be good stewards of God's created gifts so that A, our family is provided for with family, food, with shelter, food, health, and health care, and education, and the like. Uh, there's a reference here, I love it, it's 1 Timothy 5 8. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Uh, B, uh, uh, we should be provide for. We should be good stewards so that others, especially the poor, benefit from our grateful and charitable use of what God has given us at home, in church, and as neighbors and as citizens. And with this one, I think we have to be good. We have to be wise and discerning because I, I don't know. I, I think it's foolish to say that that we're not. There were no con artists and grifters back then. And as as some of the groups, the members of the pastoral membership group, pastoral mentorship group, I mean, mentioned, as you know, if you're going to err, err on the side of generosity. But be careful. You don't, you don't want to fall into a situation. My, my grandpa Jim and my grandma Dolly fell into a situation where they were trying to care for this guy who was a recovering addict. They let him live with them. And it was just a nightmare. An absolute nightmare, especially when they had to kick him out. And they wouldn't, it, it was hard to rest to convince them, like, hey, this guy's a nightmare. He's, he's, <laughs> let him go to prison. Don't stop giving him money. Clear out his stuff. Kick him out. Get him evicted. Whatever you have to do. And it can be, it can be a nightmare if you're not wise and discerning in how you care for how you provide for the poor, but at the same time, we have to make sure, you know, widows, orphans, the poor, that we care for them, we have regard for them. Um, and so we have to be careful with that, but we also need to be good stewards so that we can at least do what our part to help the poor um, and others. Uh, see, the church has the resources it needs for the proclamation of the gospel. This is the one where I, I, I if a pastor, if I knew a pastor that says that he doesn't have a trouble asking the church to tithe more, I'll look at him and say, I wonder what the quality of your ministry is, because I, I get so awkward asking for money and, and asking people, hey, we need to step up or whatever. But we, like, we have a really, I'm very grateful for how good, amazing congregation this church is for giving. And I just, I felt awkward even starting the Chester Joe ad. <laughs> I was like, we, this is just me trying to set foresight for problems down the road, but. Oh, I get so awkward asking for money, but that is one of the things that we have to make sure we do, that the, the church has the resources that we need to, to pro proclaim the gospel, to do what we need to do, whether it's just keeping the lights on or actually helping those missionaries that are overseas, helping organizations like 1517 Network and things like that, and doing what they're doing to make sure the gospel is proclaimed. Um, but that's, with that, I would say, this is me speaking, not as, me as Cam, not me as a pastor, but any pastor that looks to get rich off the church, I think it doesn't have, it doesn't, shouldn't wear the collar. Like I, I, when I get so awkward with it. I, 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 I told Ashley, I'm like, I will not get rich off this job. <laughs> there was one thing that Tom Corbell told us when we first came here. He said, one thing I did not shy away with. One Sunday in October, we were coming here and we talked about tithes. Yeah. It's my duty to do that. I'm not going to beat you when you talk with it. Yeah. But once a year, you're going to hear it from me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm terrified for that Sunday. I was very grateful that uh, I got here just under the wire. Pastor Ketching handed up. So I'm very grateful uh, for that. Oh, oh, I, think that I think that giving in church and things like that is the starting of a discipline. The Lord expects you to steward your money. And the way to do that is to discipline yourself. Yeah. To carve off where it came from <clears> first. And maybe you can't carve off 10%. Yeah. Not even, but I'll tell you this story. I worked for a Baptist guy. The first guy was one of the best. I don't believe he's ever swore, drank. Uh, you know, just straight, straight line guy. He just retired a few years ago. Keith Norris, he taught me everything I know. And I respect him all the way down to it. He got into a discussion with him and his buddy with their pastor. And he said, David said, you have to preach one time a year. And they asked him, do you give 10% of the gross or do you give 10% of the debt? He said, he just looked at him for a second. He said, fellas, if I get either one of those, we'll never talk about money in church again. And that's all he said. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never have another discussion about money in here in this church yeah. again. And that's so I think that those, but, you know, like I say, discipline mm -hmm. is, you know, it, financial discipline and all things are about discipline yourself. Because you know, the amount of money that, that Alice and I, unfortunately, waste in a week's time is, yeah. is yeah. great. And uh, that's, uh, that's uh, unfortunate. And, and but I think that those are the things that you have to do is discipline yourself. Yeah, and I think part of it, too, is to understand, you know, I don't. I never liked the hard and fast rule of 10%, like some do, the tithe, because I, I see that as law, and that's old, That's part of the Old Covenant. I think you give what you can, 
thing you can. You know, if you have, if you can only give a dollar, give a dollar. But if you can give, if you can afford to give a thousand dollars, give a thousand dollars. You know, whatever you can do. And if you like, there, the number. The coin, I mean, you just knew that Sarge was the author. It was clear that that was not your salvation. Did not no, no, not at all. No, it's not. That's that's work, and we don't do that here. But I will say this is a disciplined, oh, yes. disciplined congregation that we had. I've never came up one time at the report and not said how disciplined yeah. and generous the people are here to support. Absolutely. Because there are churches multiple times the size of us that have nowhere near, not just the regular giving, but I, I could even make a list for you and Ashley of the things that we've done for people yeah. in and around this community over the years with our very small numbers. It yeah. is a definite. Uh, it's a ble- every Sunday when I open the offering, I feel like I have been blessed by the Almighty to put it together. And when I have to, when, I, when I'm putting, when I'm putting the, be- the the plates together, and I'm like, okay, okay, I need to make sure nothing spills. So <laughs> <laughs> to me, that's a good thing. That, that was a job I took here, and I didn't really. Um, it was easy for me to do, but I do feel like that. Like I say, every Sunday when I go home, it's the first thing I do before I eat or anything like that. I get all together, and I just feel like. I've been to church and I've gotten a good message, and right here I've gotten a literal message every yeah. single Sunday. Yeah, I think you you know it goes back to what you spend your money on tells you what you care about. You know, I've been sitting here listening to all this, and I <clears throat> I think that we're losing a slowly every year we're losing more and more of a unfathomable resource mm-hmm. for the people that live through the Great Depression. People in here old enough to know their parents say, My mother did not waste anything. But you better not get you going to waste something. I mean, you we think you ate it. We've read, we read the story about the uh, grocery bag, uh, bread bag we loops. Did that, yeah. we, we, we My did mother wrapped a newspaper around our legs for our insulated clothing, um, you know. And I mean, and that sticks with me. Yeah, absolutely. And it, then like so somebody's talking about waste, it tears me up to see. Yep. Uh, I mean, these the kids we helped raise over the years, that's not, that, that little boy, that three-year-old boy, uh, this is a, this is not true. His net worth is more than my father's was at 50 years old. <laughs> because my father didn't own him, and he owed a lot. He had a lot of land he owed for it. And that boy's got thousands of dollars worth of clothes. Every time he comes to the house, yeah. would get his clothes out. His mama says it's still got the stickers on it. And I'd count on my hand with the few clothes I thought when I was getting up. Right. Jimmy, you know, you've got to pass down to me. Pass down to pass down. But that, you know, we're losing that yeah. as, a, as, a, as a people. Yeah. You know, yeah. so. we're, the, we're doing the young and the service by... Doing that, you know, everybody wants, well, I want your life to be better than mine. But actually, our life was pretty good because we learned the valuable things in our life. So when our young people get to be an adult, they'll look at you and say, I don't want to be an adult. I don't want all that responsibility. Yeah, yeah. I still say that. <laughs> I still say that. Like, I don't want an adult today. I don't want to. I don't want to. Well, we're still at home. You know, Grace. You talk about wasting. I'll get out of the car in a parking lot sometimes, and I'll see where somebody's eating their McDonald's or their mm-hmm. Burger King little thing of French fries. And the first thing in my head is, I remember when that was such a treat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just turn it down. It was such a treat. Yeah. You had to go down and, and just pray you had enough. And we stayed yeah. up Greece to do fried bacon. It was when the little can on the mm-hmm. stove yeah. you didn't waste it because it doesn't oh, eat that way. You've got to soak it in. We have to we have to appreciate it. There's nothing like bacon Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Well, and then during the war you didn't get the coupons. We didn't get the coupons. But you have to you have to appreciate you have to appreciate and be good stewards of what you have. And you know, and take care of those that that you can and take care of yourself and teach teach as best as you can and the rest is up to God and, and, and you yeah. just do what you can. But I'm grateful that we have the resources we need here and and it's 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 a good thing to do and it's it's so it's so rewarding when you get to see the product 
of your giving to the church. When the church steps out and says, hey, we just did this, hey, we just did that, whether we're taking care of being good stewards of, of a building to where you know it's easier to use and it's, it's something we could, a resource we can use for things like the pancake supper or if someone wants to have a birthday party or things like that, you know, you, that's, that's a good use of your resources mm -hmm. or we're supporting ministries abroad. And I, I, used to, I still love hearing missionaries come and report when they say, you can give me to my ministry, but the ministry that God's given me to do, and let me tell you what we're doing. And I have a really good, I have so many good friends because we went at CIU, our, uh, the, where we went to Bible college and, and seminary, um, there's so many missionaries coming out of there. I think a good, I think a good third, I don't know the statistics, but I think a good third of the seminary students are Chinese pastors. Huh? And so you get to hear the reports. I have so many good friends that are, pat, that are, that are missionaries. One of my great friends, uh, I, 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 I want to say it's Ivan, but I think he pronounces it differently because he's, he's a Latino, but he has uh, been teaching theology at a seminary in um, Central America for the last several years, and he just got made interim director. And he's just, and they, they, he said, we've been, we've been training called these pastors and training them out and indigenous pastors to go out and pastor their churches. And it's just really cool to hear it. I have another good friend of mine who's getting ready to go to Japan because there's such a need for the gospel in Japan. There's, I think, less than 1% of Japanese people are Christians. And so he wants to go and take the gospel to them. And I'm like, hey, if you want to come and talk to the church, let me know. We'll set it up. Let's, let's get out here. And, and, and it's, just wonder, it's just a wonderful thing to hear when you hear what your money's doing the money that God has given you to do, and you give it to these people, and they, they take it and they run with it. They take care of orphans. They take care of they take care of carrying the gospel to these people so that they can have that eternal reward. It's so fun. It's so wonderful to have. And then we'll finish up wrapping up this this, this commandment. We have all the, the we use our resources. The God, the God, we have to be good stewards of God's created gifts so that all creation prospers under our care for the land, the water, and the air. You know, being good stewards in how we take care. It goes back to being good stewards of creation, being good stewards of the trees, being good stewards of the animals, being good stewards of uh, whether we hunt or fish or whatever. These things are important because we, it's not just because it's not so much that, oh, you're, you, the, the stories that, you know, your, your, your hamburger had a name. And I'm like, well, I'm thankful. I'm grateful, Frank. He, he gave me a good meal, you know, but it's not taking it to an extreme. But at the same time, you want to make sure, are you taking care of the animal? Are you taking? Are you over, over hunting or over fishing? Making sure that certain animals stay around, caring for the endangered, caring for the land, caring for these things, being a good steward. If you, if you, if you take, if you cut a tree down, you use it for resources. Planting it again. If you're going to do mining, be careful how you do it. If you're going to transport oil, try to do it safely so that it doesn't cause damage. You know, don't have a spill and cause damage. These are just common sense things. Not just because it's important and we want to be good stewards, but it's just. Sense because it keeps it preserves what we have to where we are doing what we you know it's, God forbid you overhunt deer you know there's no deer left to hunt like you start telling your kids well, I don't know what venison what's venison well it's something we had 20 years ago but we don't have anymore you want to be careful you want to be good stewards of that but you want to take it to an extreme you don't want to take it to an extreme where it makes it harder on the people especially the poor it, it, it's so it's, it's so hard to eat healthy because it's so expensive to eat healthy. It's a lot cheaper to eat junk, and then and it would, and or eat food that's just terribly produced. But it's, they say, well, you have to eat the, the organic stuff. Well, it's three times as much. I ain't got that money. I mean, I can't do that. You want to be a good steward, but you got to be careful and balance it, and be wise and prudent. You get organic. You can go up there like I did when I was a kid. Yeah. You can right off the plane. <laughs> all the organic you want. Well, that's yeah, where that hard work. Yeah, if you do it yourself. Yeah. So I'm not saying I'm doing it, but I did, <laughs> I did plenty of it. I did, I, I, yeah. I did a lot of it. Oh, okay. we picked two fields four hours every yeah. day before we could ever do anything. Yeah, and it's and it's, 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 it's there's, a, there's a prudent, wise approach to it, but I think there's an extremist this extremist element in our culture today that would have us go a little further than it being a good steward. I don't want to have too many comments, but we were in Yellowstone, mm -hmm. and you know that was one that all the farming folks they show a little video we're all talking about how they were come they were get out of the arm they were claim that land they will develop it all mm -hmm. and it was one guy's idea there were no national parks in the world no no park in the world and one guy who didn't have anything said no 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 with the group there was about 30 of them just insisted that we're going to make sure that this is preserved forever and before that there was no preservation of land mm -hmm. anywhere in the world well, then you look at you look at yeah you, know, you look at Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah. Teddy Teddy you know he was an avid hunter, 
but he was a conservationist because hunting is a part of that. Hunting is important, important aspect of conservation, and being a good steward of that, and you know, you have to be a good steward of land. And um, there's been some really great people that have gone before us that have done that. Thankfully, that, that we can show off these beautiful, beautiful aspects of God's creation um, to people. But that is the seventh commandment. We shall move on to the eighth commandment. This is an interesting one that always gets debated in ethics classes. Uh, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. The central thought is as Christians, we seek to improve and protect the reputation of others so that people will think well of them. So this one gets debated. It's always, it, I like this translation better. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor rather than you shall not lie. I think it, this one captures the nuance of it and kind of helps explain a little bit better. And you run into circumstances like Rahab and the spies and things like that where you see people actively lying and rewarding, being rewarded for it. So it, there's a lot of nuance to this. So one of the things that the closer reading gives us is focusing on reputation. Why is a good reputation important? A good neighbor reputation is important so that each of us may enjoy the trust and respect of others. How do we fear and love God in keeping this commandment? By not speaking about others in ways that harm them. Harmful speech includes telling lies about our neighbor in everyday life or in the court of law, betraying our neighbors by making public their private faults or secrets, slandering our neighbors by rushing to judgment, or complaining about them or spreading rumors. Um, and we speak we love, fear and love God by speaking constructively, including defending our neighbors when people speak badly of them, drawing attention to our neighbors' good qualities and deeds, and seeking to understand our neighbors' actions in the most positive light and explaining them in the kindest possible way. So this is focusing a lot heavily on gossip, slander, and you know, the tendency of us to, oh, like the tendency, especially with social media and things like that in the younger, the younger generation in particular, of saying, well, I'm going to share this even though I don't know if it's true or not. Yeah, I mean, how many, how many problems would we solve if we just took a minute and said, hey, well, is, is that true? Did that actually happen? Is that what they actually said? Taking, making sure we're not twisting words out of, taking words out of context. And, and making sure, hey, we're not sharing people's secrets. Like if someone tells me something in confidence, for, aside from being a pastor, like if someone comes to me and tells me something in confidence, like, hey, are you okay if I share this? And it's a, it's a real, it takes five seconds to ask. Is it okay if I share this with someone so that they can pray for you too? How many people have we heard say, well, how can I pray for you? Or, or then they say, hey, you need to pray for someone, and then they, then they use that as an excuse or pretext to gossip. They said, oh, I heard this about so-and-so, and so-and-so, and then they, they tell you the whole story about their whole, all their drama, and then they said, oh, you need to pray for them. No. <laughs> That's not appropriate. That's not how it works. You don't get to, you don't get to blab people's business out there and then, and then cover it by, oh, I'm just making sure you can pray for them. Like, if they wanted them to pray for them, they'd tell them themselves. You know, and you know, or you, you or you can tell stories without using names if you can, do without damaging individuals' reputations. Like I try to use examples without damaging their reputation. Like I, that's one of the reasons I told Eliana and Sam, you never have to worry about me using you as a sermon illustration because I'm not going to put your business out there. Now I may reference something and try and paraphrase it in a way that it makes it seem like it's not you, but I'm not going to use you specifically. I'm not going to say, well, Eliana told me this once and it's hilarious and it applies to this pastor. No, I'm not going to do that. That's not how we do things. We have to make sure we, bear, we, we don't bear false witness. We have to make sure we don't damage people's reputations or make people think less of them. We want to make people think positively of our neighbors. We want to try and defend their reputation. If something we find out something negative that is true, we don't need to go around making sure, did you hear so-and-so beat his wife? Did you hear so-and-so beat his wife? Oh, oh, goodness. It may be true, but what are you accomplishing by making sure the maximum number of people know that? You know, it, it, we have to be careful with our words and how we speak about our neighbors and it, about each other. Because I know for me, like so, so many of you know what happened with me in my last my last law enforcement department agency when it, when, it, when the news broke about what had happened, what the sheriff had done, and the decisions that had been made. The number of people I had text and call me and say, "Dude, no one believes this. No one believes you did this. No one believes that you could have possibly hurt." Because I had a reputation. And not by my virtue, but because people didn't speak poorly. They were very careful. And I was very grateful to that. Like, half the reason I got through that season of my life was because I had so many people who guarded my reputation. And God guarded my reputation. I'm very grateful for it. 
you know, one of the things like with, with my kids, you know, I make sure that I don't badmouth their mother in front of them. They will, as far as I'm concerned, they don't need to know necessarily what happens between me and their mother. There may be some questions I need to answer as they get older. But I'm not, I'm not here to destroy their image of their mother. Not, their mother is not there to destroy the image of me. We, we talk positively about each other in front of the kids. We may hash things out in private, but we, but we don't. We're not. There's no. We, nothing is gained by tarnishing their, each other's reputations in front, in front of the kids. I'm not going to tarnish other pastors unless I think that. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to tarnish other pastors. I will call out heresy. I will call out false teaching, and I will say that's not someone you listen to. But I'm not going to tell you don't listen to them. I'm not going to tell you that, or not going to tell people who go to that church that they're horrible people that they shouldn't go to that church. I'm not going to tell people that because that's not going to accomplish anything. The word of God speaks for itself. If I call out false teaching, I call out false teaching with Scripture in the hopes that they might make that God might lead them where they need to go. Now, if someone's a criminal, or I think they're fleecing the poor, I'm going to call them out. But I'm not going to. I'm going to do that publicly. I'm not going to go. Did you hear about Pastor Bob? He said he did this. Can you believe that? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it publicly, and I'm going to defend myself. My present my point publicly. I'm not going to go sneaking around tarnishing people's witnesses or reputations on that. That's just no. That doesn't accomplish anything. There's a question here that's really important, too. We, well, there's two questions here. The first one is, number question 86, the Bible tells us to speak the truth in love, referencing Ephesians 4.15. What does this mean? It means to speak truthfully to others for their well-being, well -being, to build up others up toward the mature fullness of life we have in Christ. It includes gently admonishing or encouraging people to repent of their sin and pointing out the dangers of false teachings or false teachers, going to what I just said. We're going to have to speak the hard truths to each other. There's going to be times that someone's going to have to, you're going to have to go along with someone and say, hey, look, what you're doing is not only not cool, it's, not, it's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt someone else. You need to chill. There's going to be times we have to walk alongside someone and say, hey, what you're doing is not right. We have to speak the truth to them. And if we can do that well or we can do that poorly, we just have to make sure we do it well with love. If we're going to correct someone, well, even if it's a close family member, if they're doing something that's blatantly unbiblical, blatantly wrong, you come alongside and say, you're, you, you, there's a difference in me saying, the Bible says you shouldn't do that, you need to stop, you need to repent, you need Jesus. And me saying, hey, I understand where you're coming from, but this scripture says this, I don't think what you're doing is right, and I don't think it's what's best for you. Take hell off the table for a second. Let's say, I don't think this is going to give you what you think it's going to I don't think this is going to give you the fulfillment that's going to give you. How can I speak that truth in love? I can come at it hard with a hammer, or I can come in close and gentle, a pat on the back and say, hey, I don't, I don't think this is good for you. If they say, hey, I don't care, I did my part. I did my part. But I can maintain the relationship. I have a lot of good friends that disagree with me on a lot of things. I have a lot of good friends that are not walking with Jesus. They're living a certain way. They think they're walking with Jesus, but they're living a certain way, whether they're in the LGBT community or whether they are cheating on their wife or whatever circumstances, anything in between, that I love them. They're my friends. They know that I think, hey, you're, you're wrong. But they still know that if they need me, they call me, I'm there. Why? Because I'm their friend, I'm their neighbor, I'm going to love them through it. Even if I think that they're going to hell and I would throw my body down happily to make sure to try and get them to come to Jesus. They know that I, if I speak the truth to them, they know that I'm not speaking with the, with the weight of judgment. They know that I'm speaking with the weight of I love you and I don't want, I don't want that for you. That's the difference between speaking the truth. There's the speaking the truth and the speaking the truth in love and coming alongside someone saying, hey, I love you very much. And I think what you're doing is not the best. That's one of the reasons why I'm a huge believer in, in relational evangelism and relational apologetics. Because... If you know I care, especially with the younger generation, if they know you care first, they're more likely to give weight to what you have to say. I'll give an example. I was getting out of the army. I was dealing with PTSD. I had yet, I was, was years away from being diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury. I was angry, I was depressed, I was drinking a lot. And I didn't care. And I was using the language as all soldiers do, very freely, on my Facebook page. A woman at the church I grew up in, she was, she sang, she was one of the vocalists at our church, and she, sang, she commented publicly 
and then message me privately on Facebook. This was in 2010. I don't like your language. I don't think you should be doing that. I'm like, who are you? My first response was not, I think you're wrong. My first response was not to defend my actions. My first response was, who are you? My first response was, why should I care what you have to say? Well, I'm friends with your mom, and I go to your, I, I went to the church you grew up, watched you growing up. Like, but who are you? Where were you when I was in Iraq? Where were you when I went through my first marriage ending? Where were you when I survived that murder attempt? Where were you when I found out I was getting hurt, when I got hurt and I got out of the army? Where were you? Who were you? Why should I listen to you? She came, she's speaking the truth to me. She actually was right. I need to watch my language. Who was she? No one. Why should I listen to you? But if I'm in a different set of thoughts and circumstances, when I was a police officer, for example, one time he was like, hey, I think you're rushing your your call. I think you're rushing your paperwork. Okay. Why do you think I'm rushing your paperwork? Can you walk me through it? I'm like, you're right. I want you to listen to me. Why? Because that guy has backed me up for the last two months. That guy was there. That guy walked me through when I was having trouble in my marriage. That guy walked me through trying to figure out how to be a cop and a dad at the same time. That guy walked me through changing churches. That guy walked me through so many things that he was there for me anytime I needed him. So when he came to correct me, okay, I know you care about me. You're not correcting me to beat me up. You're correcting me because you love me. It is a total different dynamic. So when I come alongside someone and I say, hey, I love you, and I establish that relationship, I'm saying, hey, I love you. That's one of the reasons I try on every Sunday to come talk to everybody that's there. I love you. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad to see you. If I miss you, hey, I miss you. Are you okay? Are you feeling good? Because I want you to know that I care about you on a personal level, not just from a pulpit. I don't care... If, if you only pull one tidbit out of all the sermons I ever preach, and that teaches you something great, but if you, but if you, don't, if you walk out of this church thinking, I don't care about you, it doesn't matter what I tell you. It doesn't matter how much truth I speak to you. It doesn't matter how much I call you out. It doesn't matter. If you think I don't care about you, who am I? When your kids come to you and you say, hey, I don't think you're living right. Like, where, why do you, do you care about me or do you care about control? How, what's the dynamic of the relationship? My kids know that I love them. We talk to them every night on the phone, except the nights when I drop them off. Like, tonight he won't talk on the phone because the weddings drop them off. They know. They can talk to me about anything. Doesn't matter. If I correct them, it's because I love them. And you're driving me crazy. <clears throat> but I love them. I want them to, my, dad, my mom and dad knew. Ever I got spanked, I remember my dad spanking me. <laughs> He'd come and he's like, you understand what you did wrong? No. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. You, you hit your sister. Okay. I love you. Because I love you, I'm going to correct you. And then he spanked my butt. And then he hugged me. He said, I love you. I'm proud of you. I care about you. And I care about you too much to let you continue to waste your life. That's what I grew up with. And that's what we as Christians should do. If we're going to speak the truth. We should come alongside you. I love you. I don't want you to live this way. This isn't good for you, but I love you. Now, there's a line. There are things we cannot compromise. We cannot compromise our truth. We cannot compromise gospel. We cannot compromise the word of God. There are things that we're going to have to say, I can't go to that for you because I can't show support for it. There are things, that, whether it be a gay wedding or whether it be you're, living, you're having Christmas at your house and you're, you're living with your boyfriend and you're not married, there may be things, times where you have to say, you know what, my conscience says, I can't go to that. I can't do it. I love you. I care about you. But I can't do it because I can't use your, I can't use your pronouns. Why? Because that makes me a liar. Not because I don't care about you, but because that makes me a liar. These things we can, we have to gauge. We have to make sure that we show love and speak truth and love without sacrificing truth. So that's that, that question unpacked there. Make sure we, we're going to speak truth, speak truth and love. Make sure we're careful. And if we tried to correct someone and it didn't work out, you might have one or two trusted people you talked about with because you have to unload that. You have to carry, help someone carry that with you. Which is one of the reasons, like, I have, I'm so glad I have pastors that I can go to and I can say, hey, the confidentiality between me and them is just as confidential as the confidentiality between you and me. So I can go tell them, hey, I got this one with my congregation. I know you can't tell anyone with me. I can't tell you, but I need help. I can't carry this by myself. That's important. 
choose your friends wisely on that. But it, you don't have to go blast all of them. And then finally, the, for this, and it's moving on. Are there times when not speaking the truth may be necessary? Yes, withholding the truth may be necessary when speaking the truth would, re would result in injustice or harm. This is the age-old ethics question in every ethics class. Well, what if you're in Nazi Germany and you're hiding the Jews under the, <laughs> under the floorboard? The, the, the Nazis are technically the legal government. You're lying to them. Absolutely you're lying to them. You're trying to, because what they're doing is unjust and un, is, is against God's law. So you're trying to prevent the breaking of God's law. And at that point, you have to render unto, unto God what is God's and under Caesar what is Caesar's. And what, if Caesar demands what is God, you don't give it to him. But that means protecting someone who has done nothing wrong or to the point of what like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and several others had to do where they took an active effort to resist the Nazi government and assassinate Hitler. If you gotta do it, you gotta do it. If, if it comes to a point where you, you, sometimes you have, to, you have to resist evil and yet may involve deception. Just like there's times when it says thou shalt not commit murder, doesn't mean thou, thou shalt not kill. There are times when it's appropriate to take a life. Someone tries to threaten my wife or my kids, you better believe, assuming she doesn't beat me to it, <laughs> that my weapon's coming out and I'm going to deal with it. Absolutely, I'm going to protect my family. Is it that's why I want to? Absolutely not. You should hear the videos of cops who've had to shoot somebody afterwards, the body camera, the, the breakdown. Like, why did you make me do that? Why? Why was it worth it? And um, same thing with lying. You have to, sometimes there's times when I have to look at you full with a with straight face and say, when you ask me, hey, is that so, is that so and so? Did you see so and so? No, I didn't. There's times when a cop has to go undercover and lie about who he is and what he's doing to try and bust that drug ring because what they're doing is far worse than that deception. There are times when it's a, there are times when, <coughs> and you have to you have to use your judgment. You have to use your discernment about when it's appropriate and not depending on your conscience. You know, and and I I wonder. I don't know. If, I don't know for sure. I wonder if we see it. We'll, we'll see a day when we have to worry about that a lot more than we currently do. I don't know. I, Lord, Lord God, I pray that we do not. But that's that's how we wrestle with that commandment. We speak truth in love. We protect our neighbor's reputation. We whether it's <laughs> earned or not, and we speak. You know, and then we also have to be prepared to tell a good lie to protect the lives of. So that is that commandment. Any questions on that? And then we boogie through that pretty quick. Why? Well, it really bothers me. Why do you think people, as in a general rule, people I know, they have such a hard time to say, God is a good person. God is my neighbor. He's a good person. They'll, in a heartbeat, they'll say, I see God has drank a beer, you know, or something like that. But you know, I mean, I know a yeah. lot of good people yeah. that will not, will not, what it just said yeah. to you. And to make, you know, part of, part of being a good steward is to build people up. And very few people want to do that. Yeah, I think part of it is, <clears throat> I think part of it is it goes back to the age old story of Adam and Eve. When if I if I make you look at someone else's sin, you won't, maybe you won't see mine. When Adam says it wasn't me, it was the woman you gave me. And like that, that I love that line. The woman you gave, me. like you gave her to me. This is your fault, as much as it is hers. You know that that age old problem of humans always. That's part of our fallen nature. We that it's Adam. It's straight up like Luther references the, the idea of Adam in our flesh, but it's straight up Adam. Like hey, she did this. You know, and that, that I think part of that is if you're seeing their sin, you're not going to see mine. Um, I think part of it, too, is uh, our culture rewards it a lot more. Someone, you tell someone, oh, someone was doing a great thing the other day. I saw, I saw Frank giving money to Virgin and just, he's always there. He's just on point of it and everything's great. He's just helping his neighbor as much as he can. Okay, that's cool, cool. It doesn't really further the conversation. But if I say, I saw Jack over there. He was flirting with the girl at Chick-fil-A. I think he married her. That produces, a, that's more interesting. That produces more conversation. And our culture rewards that. It rewards it not just in interactions one-on-one. -on -one, it rewards it in pop culture. 
you can't, like, soap operas, mm -hmm. sitcoms, uh, all these things. Like, you can go on the list, movies, songs. Like, it, it just constantly throwing, uh, to use the common parlance, to just throwing mud at each other, just or, or throwing shade, is, I guess, is what Eliana said something the other day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she used that phrase. I know. Let's, let's leave it alone. Um, she's getting too old. She needs ten this year. Is the word jealousy come in that somewhere? I think jealousy. I think jealousy is part of it, but I think a lot of it's just that there's there's a path you get more reward in the culture today and for telling fails. someone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. People love that. Oh yeah. Fail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. So you're more likely, and it, it accomplishes a goal. Well, I got a question about a lie. If you say that it's okay sometimes to tell a lie if you're protecting a loved one or something. But, but what if we're confronted sort of like the denial of Christ to protect your own life? I mean... That's different. Okay, so what if we're confronted? Are you Christian and you know that the ramifications are going to be horrific? Mm -hmm. Do you lie? If you're complaining, are you talking about for yourself or someone else? Yes? <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's you, you should be steal. Like we talked about in Sunday school, steal yourself. For whatever comes, and you confess Christ. Now, if they ask you, "Is Mary a Christian?" No, I've never seen her at the meeting. <laughs> you know, I, you know, like, you know, the, 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 if you, I think there's a fine line. Like, if there's a point where it's one thing to lie to protect the innocent from from um, persecution, right. to protect, protect the innocent from death, to protect the innocent from injustice. Like when you look at Schindler, Schindler's List, you know, what he did, the efforts he went to to preserve as many as he could, you know, the efforts that so many did to try to preserve, or you look at the efforts of the, the abolitionist movement, you know, Sojourner Truth and these others who, who um, moved human life north to where they could be free and safe. You know, the, the, the efforts of uh, uh, even in the the efforts of Rahab, spies, those who are instruments of the government to try and protect us and keep us alive. Soldiers, undercover police officers, undercover law enforcement, um, uh, things like that. Those are times when it's appropriate. But if it's you you're protecting, if you're lying to protect yourself, and that's not I, think, I think that's not good. I, I, I personally would err on the side of, okay, if someone asks me, are you Christian? Well, yeah. Well, you know, absolutely. <laughs> I'm not, I, will, I will happily I would consider it an honor to be martyred for right. the faith, to be imprisoned for the faith. Like that, I, like God saw, saw me worthy enough to be persecuted. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. But, you know, I think there's a fine line. If I'm lying to protect myself from, uh, am I a Jew or not? Well, I'm not, thankfully. But, you know, a situation like, things like that, you know, you find yourself in a situation, I think you have, there's a fine line. You just, I, think, I think for me personally, I would argue that if, you're, if you have to lie about your faith, no, absolutely do not do it. But if you're lying to protect someone else from injustice, if you're lying to protect someone else from persecution, if you can, to preserve the church, I think that's appropriate. I think that would be acceptable. But I think in those situations, the best way to be able to discern those situations is staying in your scriptures, staying, keep receiving the sacraments, doing those things that strengthen your faith and strengthen the spirit within you so that when the time comes and you find yourself challenged with that, you can sit for a minute and just shoot one of those air prayers like, God, guide me to what I need to say. That's what, what, what I should say. And say what you need to say. And then just follow what you need to do to protect as much life as possible. I think, that's, I think that would be the appropriate response to that. Lord willing, you will never find yourself in a situation where you are challenged that way. I don't know. Um, I think it may come to that. It may. It may. Um, but, you know, if it does, we'll deal with it. Right. And, uh, and, uh, you know, maybe we all have uh, this story. This is off the rabbit hole, but um, my mom and dad were in Australia for a few years for mom's work, and the church they were going to is called the Gala, the Church of the Gala, and uh, Aussies gotta love them. But um, they had signed up to do pen pals with Christians around the world, and the one of them that had written my mom, she asked my mom, she had my mom ask her, how how can we pray for you? This woman was in the Sudan. She was being persecuted actively for her faith. Her whole, com her whole community was being persecuted to the point of being in danger of death. And this woman 
in the Sudan, I think it was Sudan, somewhere in East Africa, said, pray that we will have the strength to endure. They didn't ask, I mean, you, you could have easily said, pray that the persecution will be lifted. No. Pray that we will have the strength to endure. Oh, to have that kind of faith. I don't even know that I can ask. Like, please pray that this lifts up. I couldn't make it through basic. Like, please make it stop. <laughs> but, but, you know, like, to have that kind of strength, that I pray and hope that we as Christians, that we will have that strength to say, give us the strength to endure. And have the joy of Peter and James as they lead the, the, lead the saints in, in Acts saying, praising God and giving get thanks that they had they have been seen worthy of, of being persecuted. You know, I, I, I hope and pray if, we, if and when that comes that we will face that well. So we're, we're finishing up the Ten Commandments now. We're going to be finishing up with the Ninth and Tenth Commandments here. And... Um, so these are, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, manservant, maidservant, ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So in the ninth commandment, it says, what does this mean? We should fear and love God so we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or get in a way which only appears right, only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. And then with the tenth commandment. We should hear, fear and love God so we do not entice or force away our neighbor's wife, workers, or animals or turn them against him, but urge them to stay and do their duty. Uh, the central thought, as Christians, we seek to live a life of contentment by giving thanks for the daily blessings that God provides for us and our neighbor. Um, so what is coveting? Uh, number Question 88 says, the coveting is the sinful desire in our hearts to acquire for ourselves anything that belongs to our neighbor. It is also the desire to draw away from our neighbor for our own benefit or anyone who is important to our neighbor, a spouse, friends, and so on. And so when you look, this is one of the, one of the, one of the more important commandments because a good, good one, one of the good ways to just really ruin in the peace of your life is to look at someone else and say, I want what he has. And just really become obsessed to the point where you become bitter or even to the point where you're moved to start doing things about it. Because instead of being, at that point, you're not being content with what you have. You're looking at what someone else has and you're saying, why, if I, I would be happy if I just had that. I would be happy if I just had that. And the funny thing is, is most people who say that and then they get that and then they realize, I'm not happy. <laughs> and a lot of times you see someone like, well, I, I'd be happy if I was just, have a little more, if I could just work more and get more money. I, I'm coveting more money because, and I'm missing out on what I'm having at home. There's a difference between being a hard worker and being so obsessed that I'm coveting what the rich have that I want that, and then I'll be happy. Like, if I could just get that two, you know, 4,000 square foot house on the lake with six mm -hmm. bedrooms and three bathrooms and, and two boats and all and eight cars. <laughs> yeah, all these things. You can't get that in a 4,000 square foot. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But you, you think you, you think you, you start thinking that way, and you think, well, then you get it. You start working. You put everything you have into it to try and get that. And then once you get it, you realize you've left everyone else behind. You've left, you've missed opportunities. You've missed chances to be with your kids. You've missed chances to be with your wife. I knew a, I, you know the story, the story of the man who put like I just got to provide a really good life for my wife, and she'll be happy. Provide, 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 and then you come back and you finally get to where you need to be, and then you realize that she serves you the divorce papers. Why? Because you, you weren't there. The other aspect of it is like, oh, if I was just happy, I'm not happy with my current spouse, so I'm just going to, this is very common in our culture today, I'm just going to divorce her and hope that I can find the next person. Or they find the next person and say, I'm going to divorce, and then commit adultery, and then, and then they divorce, use that as an excuse to divorce their spouse. Um, and they find that, oh, this is just as miserable as the last time. <laughs> and what they realize, what they never realize most of the time, and most of them don't realize is, oh, it's miserable because I, I didn't handle the trials and, and difficulties of marriage the first time, and instead of, that's why I ran, rather than deal with them. And it, realizing that comes with it a measure of humility in not coveting what other people because a lot of times what ends up happening is you hear the words, I deserve that. I deserve that. No, you, no, you don't. <laughs> you deserve death and destruction and hell. That's what you deserve. Yeah. God, by his grace, gives you something you don't deserve. 
but you end up falling into this desire and you find out you don't, you're not as peaceable. You know, it's funny, I, um, I've seen people who will look at my, my relationship with my parents, and I wish I had that relationship with my parents. I'm like, work on it. You know, if you want that, you can't have a relationship with my parents, but <laughs> my parents are awesome. But, you know, have, you can build, you can try to build that relationship, and it's not the same, but it's unique. You think, oh, I wish my marriage looked like that. I, I just want that marriage. Like, you, how many times do you, you see the, I remember this, this, these commandments make me think of um, the old show uh, the, from the 90s, Home Improvement, when Tim would come home and his wife, would, his wife's friend there, and he's like, oh, great. And it, she's always just, just take, you know, just taking terrible shots at him and treating him like crap and saying, oh, you can do better, you can do better. How many people have been ruined because they listen to the words of someone say, you can do better, instead of saying, no, what I have is pretty great. Now, if, you, if you're in a situation where what you have is pretty awful, that's different. Like if you're in an abusive situation or things like that. But, you know, I remember hearing a story my mom told me. I, I can't remember who told her this. She was complaining. So she, I don't know if it was a story that sh happened to her or sh a story she heard told. Was was uh, my she was she was overheard someone complaining about her husband snoring. And she and then this this widow told her, one day you'll miss it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's one day you'll miss it. You, you, there's that the, the thing that drives you crazy, man. You're gonna miss it. And you know, there's you, you think, oh, it's driving me crazy. I wish he didn't do this. I wish I had a husband that did this. I wish I had a spouse that did this. I wish I had a job that did this. I wish I had this much money so I could do that. You're missing out. What's right? You know, God doesn't, Jesus, when he taught his disciples to pray, he says, thank you, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. And give, give us this day our daily bread. It goes back, it harkens back to man, the manna in the wilderness, where they were only allowed to collect for that day. And anything that they collected past that went bad, except for the Sabbath, so they wouldn't have to work on the Sabbath. And so, why? Because they had to be content, one, content with what they had, but two, trust that God was going to meet their needs the next day. You know, trust that if, 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 if I, I had a friend of mine who was struggling because his wife wasn't get, meeting his, wasn't meet his needs, you know, wasn't being there for his as a partner. She was always, she was doing, struggling with some things. And so she, she wasn't meeting his needs in, in intimacy or anything like that. It's like, I just don't know what to do. I'm about to leave her. I said, stop expecting her to provide and ask God to provide. If you need, if you need something, God will provide it for you. So if you trust that God will provide, okay, I, you trust that, oh, I need a, a bigger house for my family. God will provide, if you say, I'm going to take that to God and say, hey, God, I, you know what I need. This is what I need. Help me get this. As opposed to, I'm going to do everything in my power to get that, and it turns out not to what you want. I mean, I'm kind of rambling, but a good, a good attitude, I think, a, a approach to this was, it would be, there's two, so recently I watched two different videos on Instagram. And one, they were both dads finding out that their, their wives were having multiple kids, like triple, triplets or, or twins and things like that. And the one dad reacted, how are we supposed to, he freaked out. He, he just walked, it was not, he, was, he did not handle it well. He freaked out thinking, how am I gonna hamper? We already have two kids and we're having triplets. How am I gonna do this? We're, this is not a good idea, this is awful. He freaked out and then, of course, he's making fun of him. Well, then there's another video. It was one of the sweetest videos. She's like, this is baby A, this is baby B, baby C. And he's like, okay. There, there's three babies. He goes, three? Three babies? And he's so excited. And she goes, well, the lady, there's three of them. He goes, are they healthy? Are you okay? Are they okay? Well, yeah. Okay, why, why is this bad news? <laughs> why? Two different perspectives. He's like, we're going to need a bigger house. <laughs> but it's, it, which is true. It may be true. But there's different perspectives. When you say, well, I have this need. This is how am I going to do this? How am I going to how am I going to love my wife when she's going through this? Or how am I going to do this if, she, if if I don't have this much money? How am I going to do these things that I want to do? Have the perspective of I need that to be happy versus I need God to meet my need. Does that make sense? The different perspective there versus coveting and the humility of recognizing I need God to provide for my needs because that's what He does. We talked about that a little bit this morning. That, that whole dependence on God. For every little thing, trusting in God's provision rather than thinking, I want that to be happy, I need that to be happy. 
And you know, it's 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 one of those things. Um, it's just I think our culture is definitely lost. They forgot uh, to the point that you have women thinking, well, I need intimacy. I saw a really interesting video talking about how it's talking about the OnlyFans thing, where you have these young ladies who are basically doing porn at, doing porn at home on these OnlyFans subscriptions to make, to make money. And, and he was explaining, he's like, these women don't feel safe to get intimacy in the way they should get it and get the approval the way they should get it through relationship, through intimate relationships. So they turn to that, they can get the affirmation, they can get the pat on the back and, and the, oh, you're beautiful, oh, you're great, and make some money at it too with the barrier of a camera screen so they don't have to risk getting hurt. Because they'd rather they covet the intimacy, they covet the relationship, they covet that that what they think is romance to a certain extent. They covet the money, but they don't want to take the risk because they covet that, and it, it damages them more. Than, actually, I would argue it damages them more than it damages their wonderful bodies. And it's horrible. It's not what it's not what we want for our kids. It's not what we want for each other. Like why why aren't you happy with what you have? Why aren't we content with what we have? Like, I, I don't, I don't need a lot of things. I have what I need. There's, no, I need a lot of books. I need more books. But, um, but no, I, I, you know, if I, I was thinking about how much peace and contentment there is in the little, when you just have just enough, you don't have to worry about it. That's one of the things I remember about the plane, being in Iraq. It was so much simpler. I didn't have to worry about. It. I didn't have to worry about where I had to live. I wasn't going to get evicted. <laughs> so, you know, I lived, I either had a bed somewhere or in a, some, in, a, in a foxhole or I had a bed in my shoe, you know? I didn't have to worry about my bills. I didn't have to pay any. I didn't have any bills. I didn't leave anything back home. I was single. I didn't have to worry about it. I didn't have car payment. Nothing. I didn't have to worry about my food. It was all provided for me. Literally, the only thing I had to worry about was someone trying to kill me. I, I mean, and two, it sounds crazy. But genuinely, when that's the only thing you have to worry about, that's a simple life. I think a lot of veterans struggle with coming back because, not because what was over there was so hard, but what's over here is harder than over there. Because it's so much simpler, because you can you have a contentment. You deal with it. It sucks, but you embrace the suck. You, you suck it up and you drive on and you move, you do what you gotta do. But here, you have everything. You have so much, oh, you need another TV. It's Super Bowl Sunday, you need another TV for that. You know, did you know TVs go on sale right before Super Bowl Sunday? You can, get, you can get a better deal on a television right before Super Bowl Sunday. That's it's, just, more it's, it's genius. It's, it's genius. So they're telling you, oh, you can't, you can't be happy unless you, you get a Super Bowl Sunday or a TV game for Super Bowl. You can't be happy unless you have the newest car. Then cars get more and more and more expensive. You can't be happy unless you have the latest video game. I, 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 I enjoy video games because it was something my dad and I did together growing up. But... Uh, I can't. Remember. I think that this this last chapter we bought three. I've bought three video games in the five years in the, la in the five years we've been together, because like I don't like half of them are worth it. You know, it, I think oh, I, the, the culture wants you to think, oh, you have to, if in order for your relationship to be good, you should be having sex like so many times a month. Like, wait a minute, why? Wait, but I don't want I, my wife isn't a piece of meat. She's not a toy for me to play with. My wife is my partner. I need her more present. To enjoy, th I can't enjoy things as much unless she's with me. It has nothing to do with whether we're intimate. It's whether is she next to me when we're doing something together. I miss her just. It, it, that's that's romance. That's relationship. You know, and I think people aren't content. They're not content with what they have. They're not content if they're single. If you can't be content single, you're not going to be content married. If you're not if you can't if you can't be content with the little you have, you're not going to be content with more. Because you can't be a good steward of it. I try to explain that to the kids. You don't need more toys. You need to deal with the toys you have. <laughs> it actually works better. I was so happy yesterday. So yesterday we were at we were in South Carolina for uh, my friend's funeral, my dad friend's dad's funeral, and so we were at mom. The funeral was in the afternoon. We spent the night at mom and dad's house playing that with the kids. Uh, Ashley went to a, a women's brunch at my mom's uh, church, and so I had the kids, just the three of us. My dad was asleep, and. Um, we got up, they were watching TV when I first got up and, the, and everything, and then we turned the TV off to go to Starbucks to get cake pops and, and frabs, and we sat and had a conversation. And then they finished their stuff and we went home. We went back to mom and dad's house. That TV didn't come on again. 
until mom and dad were home. Mom, mom and uh, Ashley were home, and we ate popcorn to watch a movie. They were content. They played, and they didn't even play with toys. They were playing a uh, restaurant, asking me what I wanted to order from Chick-fil-A. <laughs> they were content, because it worked out. They don't need toys. Like, they don't have a lot of toys at our house. They don't. They don't spend enough time there to justify having a ton of toys at our house. But they love to play Clue. They love to watch Bluey. They love, there's little things here. You can be content in a little. You get a lot more out of that. You can teach that. You don't need a lot. I'm going to fail one on you. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, it happened this morning when his daughter went up and lit the candle. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. I didn't realize it. She got a big thrill out of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But she didn't get as big a thrill out of it as you did. Mm-hmm. We got back in the choir and we said, look, she's emotional. I was. <laughs> I was in tears. <laughs> I was in tears. I was so proud of her because she, because she, that's the cool thing. That is so cool because I, if you do it right, if you teach it, if you teach and you live for Jesus well, I don't have to ask them to do things. They will ask to do things. They want to be a part of it, not just because they want connection with me, but because they think, oh, this is important to him and Ami, so and it's important to all these people I care about, so it must be important to me. So I need to participate. That was the beauty of the moment. Like I didn't think about it. I never thought that I'll ask them if they wanted to do something on a Sunday morning, except for when uh, during Advent when we did the candles on uh, Christmas Eve. So to see her ask, say, "Hey, can I?" Just, she comes to me in the offices for get ready this morning. Can I have? Can I do the candles? I'm like, it took me a minute. I'm like, do the candles? Like, you talk about lighting them at the beginning. She goes, "Yeah." I'm like, do you want to? Yeah. Okay. And I'm thinking, oh, it's not that big a deal. And then she did it. I'm like, oh crap. I'm like, I, I'm not gonna be able to preach. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> my, throat, my heart's in my throat. I was, emo- I was emotional because it was so something so simple. Because she, thank God, <laughs> thank God, she's learning despite everything she's that little girl's been through in her nine, nine years of life. That this is important. And and that's if you can, if you live that way, if you live, hey, I don't need that much. It's okay. My parents, you know, I made the joke the other day, a couple weeks ago, my parents haven't had matching furniture ever in my life that I can remember. They had matching chairs. Their chairs would always match because they'd get them together. They'd get them in a set whenever they'd buy new chairs. But they've never had matching furniture. Like this, I think the last this, this round of furniture, they just got some furniture in their bedroom, in their master bedroom recently in the last few years that matches. It's the first time in my entire life that I remember them having matching furniture. And they were, we were always happy. We were always perfectly fine with it. Um, so when I sit here and think, man, I have matching, more matching furniture earlier than my parents did, man, I should, I should be thankful for that. <laughs> but you know, how, how much more peaceful life was because my parents cared more about the time they spent with me and my sister than whether our furniture matched. My dad spent more time at home. It was easier for him. My mom was a nurse. My dad was in, in, uh, an engineer. It was easy for him to take. He'd, he'd always be able to find, from a good job, he'd always be able to find work. It was easy for him to take out of work to stay home with us. So I had a really amazing relationship with my dad as well as my parent, mom. Also, mom, because mom, mom was working. She was the higher breadwinner. She brought, brought more in, so it was easier for him to stay home. And he was home. The times that he was unemployed were times that I needed the home. That was more important than whether we had a big old house or boats or went hunting all the time or did all these different things or went on all these trips. That mattered more. And I think, you know, when we look at that, People who covet and say, well, I wish I had that. Well, why? What would you do with it? <laughs> what would you do with it? Is it really going to give you that much peace? And, you know, I think if, if God has given us gifts, so we shouldn't look at our neighbor and say, well, I wish I had their gifts. Well, are you taking care of your gifts? Because if you're not taking care of your gifts, why should you have your neighbor's gifts? Um, and I think, you know, we get, it's, it's easy to get tempted. It's easy to get to tempted, especially in today's society with the way advertising works of, and be dissatisfied. Oh, you should, you should have this. You should have that. You know, and shoot, there's a whole television show. We, we frown on guys that date multiple women at one time, but there's a whole television show devoted to one man dating 20 different women. I mean, and it's a popular show. It's been on for forever, The Bachelor. Holy crap. Our culture tells us to do the exact opposite of what the scriptures do. They want it. The culture wants us to be dissatisfied because they need to go spend money so they can make money. We don't have to. We shouldn't have to crave other things, and that's okay. 
we, if we have, if we're happy with what we have, and, and it doesn't mean that ambition is a, is a sinful thing. You know, it doesn't mean that hey, I want if I want to be the best, I want to fill my business and do really well. That does, that's not a bad thing. But why are you doing it? Are you building that ambition, at, and how are you doing it? Are you doing it because you want more? Are you doing it at the expense of your family? Then that's the wrong way to do it. But if you're doing it because you want to be the best at what you have, you want to meet a need that your culture, your, your, your community has, absolutely, be the best you can. If you're going to be the best cop, or be a cop, be the best cop you can. If you're going to be a businessman, be the best businessman you can. But give the glory to the Lord, be content with what you have, and don't do it at the expense of your family. You know, I, I, I remember a good friend of mine told me a story. It was when he was a pastor. It was his first call. And he was there like just, just moving, moving, moving. And one day, his mom, his wife and daughter were driving by. His daughter was three or four years old. They drove by the church. And his daughter said, my daddy lives. That's where daddy lives. <laughs> and his mom, his, his, mom, his wife said, no, daddy lives with us, man. Daddy lives there. And she, his wife told him that story. He immediately took a month off. Immediately. He's like, I have to reevaluate what's important. That, I, he told me that story. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's a gut punch. I never want people to think that this is more important than my wife and kids. I'm very grateful for the, 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 the I have the flexibility to do what I need to do. Like, if I'm here, if she gets lunch at 1 o'clock on a Wednesday, I love you guys, but I'm not waiting for confession. I'm going to go have lunch with her because I don't want she, she works 65 hours a week. <laughs> well, she's in the, in the academy right now because that's more important. We, get, we take, take advantage of the time we have. No one, nothing should be, you should not be doing, going after ambition and, and wealth and things like this at the expense of your families. And it goes in, 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 your, in later life, if many of you are, that goes for how much you spend your time volunteering, things like the, the, the things you do now. Make sure you're still making time for the kids, the grandkids. Make sure you're making time for your spouse while you can. Make sure time you make it take advantage of the moments because and, and check your check yourself. I'm not sure what that looks like because I haven't lived there. I can't I can tell you what the text says about what coveting and how that looks in a day to day life. And from my perspective, that looks probably a lot different from you guys at this point. But when you consider the core value of it, of being content with where you're at, that's true across the board, no matter where you're at. Being content with where you're at, whether you're going through the difficulty of illnesses or I, I, uh, you know, you're going through the difficulty of a rough relationship with a child or a grandchild, you know, I, I... I struggle, like for instance, I struggle with the fact that kids spend most of their time in South Carolina. It kills me as a dad, it kills me. But I'm grateful I have them. My kids are alive. Even if we don't get to talk every day, I don't get to walk them to school, I don't get to help them with their homework every time, they talk to me every day. And I get to, and then they can tell me about their day when I can pry it out of them. <laughs> it started early. I was like a Sammy can't focus to save her life. She's just all over the place. I love it. Um, but they're alive. I would much rather have them alive and live with their mom, and I see them once a month or twice a month, than them not exist at all. If you have a rough relationship with your kids or your grandkids, at least they exist. At least they're there to love. If you don't get to see them as much as you can, hey, technology is amazing. <laughs> FaceTime, phone call, whatever. It's amazing. Don't be, don't be covetous of, oh man, I wish they would do this. I wish they would spend more time with these things like, you know, that, that old, that lady down the street, her grandkids come and see them every week. Well, one, that's exhausting. Um, but two, okay. So first you check yourself to make sure what can I do about it? But second of be great, be content with what you have at the moment. Be grateful. And if you're not getting what you want, think you'd be getting, if you're not getting that relationship the way it should be, You need something to pray. When Sammy needs something, she's still small enough that she can't get what she needs. So she comes and says, Daddy, can you help me? That's how we should be approaching God. God, I want something. If he says no, <laughs> suck. <laughs> Find something else. If he says yes, he will give it to you in his timing. But the first
first thing we should be doing when we want something is go to God. I want God, I want a better marriage. God, prayer first. God, help me be, help me have a better marriage. And if that means help me be a better part, better husband, help me be a better husband. Help me, help them be a better wife. Help them be a better husband. Help them be a better wife. Prayer is our first response because it's God who does the work, right? We don't do it. God does the work. If I'm screwing up, then that's my work. But if God's doing it, then he's, he'll give us what we need. If you want, if, God, I want a better relationship. I wish my kids would call me more. God, help my kids call me more. Then call them. You know, nothing says you can't pick up the phone. Even if it's an awkward conversation, I need to call my sister more. I'll be honest. I need to call her more. Because I wish I had a better relationship with her and I'm not going to sit around waiting for her to call me. I want to call her. I need to call her more. That's on me. I can do my part. But I ask God, hey, give us a good relationship. So that when the day comes that our parents are with you, I have my sister. You know, if, you, if whatever you want, the whole point of these two, com- these two commandments is whatever you want, ask God for it. If you have healthy ambitions, okay, that's fine. But don't do it at the expense of what God has already given you. And if God says no, be okay with it. That's a hard place to be, and I'm still not there. There will be days that I'm like, man, I need another book. <laughs> or right now, God, I need you to sell my house in Tennessee so I don't have to pay this year. <laughs> I don't know what God's trying to teach me at the moment. It's driving me crazy, but I have to be okay with it. I never thought I'd be, I, I never thought coveting would apply to uh, wanting to get rid of somebody. <laughs> but it does. Um, so as, as we close out these commandments, is there any questions about that? I know that, that was a lot real quick, and I pretty much spoke to preach a mini sermon, sermon there. Um, is there any, any questions that on that? We didn't really go through the question that but if... Well, one thing that I have to keep reminding myself, and it took me a long time, is to come to what I believe. You know, you got this person that, yeah, somebody's stronger in this point than you are. Mm-hmm. You need it. But Jesus was born in Carmel. These mm-hmm. Ten Commandments preceded his birth. Jesus hurt. Jesus questioned, not didn't question God, but he was highly tense when it came to the this season of mm-hmm. when. He knew that it was getting ready to come now. Mm-hmm. And he was sweat blood. Mm-hmm. You know. He had questions. He said, God, why have you forsaken me mm-hmm. from the cross? You know. He was suffering. Yeah. <clears throat> he had good times growing up. He went to a wedding. He saw a pretty bride. Yeah. The thing was, he didn't act on the temptation. Yeah. There's four here stronger than me. Okay. And to get that in perspective, that Jesus actually, his feet got dirty. Yeah. You know, he got hungry. Yeah. He cried. You know, he was tempted. Popular, but he still spoke the truth, and even though it cost him popularity, even though he he lived by these ten commandments, absolutely, there's not one in here that has. Yeah, and he, I know I have it, and I'm just from your conversation, I'm pretty sure you have it on yourself. (laughs) Absolutely, yeah, it is. You know, it's amazing. You never encounter Jesus in his most in, in his humanity more powerfully than you do in the Garden of Gethsemane, in that moment where he's begging God, "Let this take. If there's any other way." Please, I don't want to do this. Like, and he's begging God. Like, at the, I, cause it wasn't just the physical agony of the torture and the cross. It was the spiritual agony of he was drinking the cup of the wrath of God. That's nothing small. Even for God. <laughs> Even for God the Son. He's drinking the, the cup of his Father's wrath in that moment. He somehow fits into our scripture today, the gospel, where, I mean, where he was, when the gospel was the lesson probably getting ready to slaughter his own son. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's a powerful moment. And, and, you know, thank God he did it. <laughs> so, so thankful that he did it so that we can be saved. It's so amazing. And that divine mystery that, that saves us so that we don't have to worry when we screw up one of his commandments. Um, so moving into the close, 
What does God say about all these commandments? He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children of the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his wrath and do not, and not do anything against them. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. Central thought, as Christians, we confess that God jealously guards his commandments so that all within his creation may prosper. So, when we, when we look at this, we, we, see, we move through these questions here a little bit. Um, one is, why does God describe him as a jealous, himself as a jealous God? Because in our culture, we think of jealousy as being a negative trait. Uh, God, the main reason is God refuses to share us with other, God, other gods. It's, when God says I'm a jealous God, there's, when I'm jealous of someone, so if Ashley were talking to a, co a male coworker, and I, if I were to get jealous, one, it's, it's a sin because I'm prideful enough to think she belongs to me, even though she's my wife. Like, I don't own her. She's part of me. So therefore, it's not ownership. It's we sh we're one person. But two, it, I'm failing to trust her. I'm failing her to trust her, her keeping those commandments. That, that kind of dynamic of jealousy is a negative a dynamic, thinking that I deserve more than I do, which, all I, as I said before, all we deserve is sin and death and hell. That's what we deserve as human beings, every single one of us, regardless of what we do. God, when he's jealous, he's jealous for what he deserves. He 100% deserves worship. He 100% deserves uh, Obedience. He 100% deserves to be to all the worship, all the glory, all the obedience. No other being in the universe deserves as he does. So for him to be jealous is not a negative trait. It's because he does, he's jealous for what is his. It's his. He deserves it. So we, he absolutely is a jealous God. He doesn't want us to share. He doesn't. He refuses to share us with other gods. So what moves God to punish or bless? Disobedience provokes his God to righteous anger and to punish sin. God's un undeserved loving kindness moves him to, to forgive and bless us for the sake of Christ. Uh, there's some theological terms. This is God's proper work versus God's alien work. It's just a way of saying, okay, in his work, in his dis when, when we disobey God's anger and wrath, he desires the destruction of the sinner. Uh, Martin Luther calls this the, the, hidden, the will of the hidden God versus the God of the revealed God, where he, he, he uh, gives kindness and grace and God through the gospel, through Christ Jesus. God reveals his gospel, his salvation through Christ, and in, in his hidden state, he desires the destruction of the sinner, where he drives us under the weight of the law to the gospel, to the revealed God in Jesus Christ. So what he what, so in this God, God's punishment, the desire to punish or bless is based on his righteousness and his, his two characteristics of his righteousness and his loving kindness and his grace and mercy. And he expresses his loving kindness, grace, and mercy in the person of Jesus Christ and the work that he did for us. He expresses his wrath and anger and righteous and ju judgment through uh, his punishment of sin. And we see examples of that throughout the Old Testament. And we'll see the ultimate example of that uh, at the final day. And we see that. We actually see that example as well at the cross. That God's full righteous anger is poured out and, and his justice and his punishment is poured out on Christ. Christ takes all of it for all the sin of the world in that moment. Spiritually and physically. So what's our response? We should reject all other gods. We should turn to God in repentance, trusting in his mercy for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we should eagerly seek to know God's will and gladly do what he commands. So we cannot keep these commandments. There's not a commandment, especially with the nuance, like going into the detail. It seems like one, you hear these commandments as one sentence, and then you go into detail like, oh, <laughs> oh, I did that. <laughs> I definitely broke that one. I, I broke that one and that one and all ten of them. So absolutely, we should be punished for those sins. Our response to that is repentance and recognizing I can't fix this. I can't keep this commandment. I put, if you break even one of those commandments, you deserve punishment and death. That punishment is carried out. When God says, I punish, I will not by any means leave the guilty unpunished. He did not leave us unpunished. But our punishment was taken by Christ. We are, uh, we are by still guilty. But we've been, our, our sentence has been commuted, our sentence has been taken upon by Christ. He paid the penalty for us. That brings a little more weight to it. It's not just that he died for our sins. 
We deserve death and destruction and the full wrath of God Almighty, which is absolutely terrifying in a way that you, there's no analogy that could fit it. And Christ himself stepped in and said, I'll take that. And so in our repentance, we say, hey, he, he said he's going to take that. I'm, I'm going to let him cover my filth. I'm going to let him cover my death. I'm going to let him take my judgment. He's, he's taken my judgment. He can do that. I'm going I'm to do what he says to do. I'm going to throw myself upon him for his sake, for repentance. And as a result of that, we get, we are equipped to better try, better keep his commands. And one day, one day, come Lord Jesus, we will lose our sinful flesh and we will be able to keep his commandments again. Where we won't have, we will not break them. Where we will not fall into sin. Where we will not be tempted. We will no longer be fallen and because of Christ. And I look forward to that day. So when, how does God carry out his punishments and blessings? God punishes us by subjecting to us the difficulties of an earthly life in a fallen world, by authorizing parents and other authorities to discipline us when we've done wrong. A handing, and, and, and there's a note here, the Old Testament, God often used foreign power to punish Israel. He uses country to punish other countries. Handing us over to our self-destructive habits and their consequences. These are the ways he punishes us. You can't look at someone and say, oh, they got a cancer diagnosis. Oh, God's punishing them for sin. That, that's not how that works. We don't know why, God, why they got cancer. It may, it, we have no reason to know why. All we need to know is that person is suffering. We're going to come alongside them and, and love on them and love our neighbor and point them to Jesus. And hope and, and point to them and say, look, regardless of what happens with this diagnosis, Jesus. Jesus. That is the point. That is the focus. We do not know why people suffer. We know that all of suffering is part of sin in one way or the other. It's, it's a part of the greater sinful state of the world. That's just a fact. That's just how it is. God allows these things. Um, sometimes the punishment is as simple as the natural consequences of the sin you committed. You break, you, you break into someone's house and steal some stuff, you go to jail. God's, I, I, tell, I used to tell people all the time when I worked for the police department, God may have forgiven you for the eternal, for the eternal consequences, but he's not saved you from the temporal ones. You still have to go to jail. You still have to pay the penalty. It is what it is. Um, so sometimes that punishment is, is the temporal punishment of the consequences of, our, of sin through the state, through, you know, you've messed up with your spouse and now you're divorced. Sometimes the, this, the natural consequences of sin, whether it's yours or your partner's or both, you know, whether it's yours or your spouse's or both, you know. Sometimes there's just multiple ways that God does this in our, in our life today. But we, we don't have the authority unless God himself steps down and says, yes, this is punishment for your sin. Unless he does to the prophets in the Old Testament repeatedly. We can't say if someone's born blind or if someone has to go to death or someone is suffering from some physical ailment or, or poverty or whatever, that is necessarily the consequence of sin. We don't have that authority. Shoulder and say, Well, this is what God's doing. <laughs> God doesn't tell us, it's none of our business. What we do know is that God has told us to preach the gospel, love our neighbor. That's what we do. So, um, God fulfills his promises by blessing the earth, by giving us parents and other authorities for supportive life, which is interesting if you notice this. Uh, in, in the previous question, or earlier in, in B, it says uh, authorize, he, one of the ways God punishes is by authorizing parents and other authorities. And then as one of the ways he blesses us is by giving us parents and other authorities. They are both, it's, we, there's a blessing and a curse there. That our parents are both a measure of, of punishment if we screw up. Our authority, the authorities are a measure of punishment if we screw up, but they are also a blessing. I think most parents think child children sometimes are both. Probably. <laughs> and sometimes, yeah, probably. sometimes not quite good I, blessing as they thought that was. I, I tend to think uh, <laughs> being a parent is, is a trial to test our faith. Oh, yeah. Having a parent is, a, is the punishment for our sin. <laughs> but, um, but I, you know, when it's interesting, interesting to us today, you know, you think our government's a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. And it's a pain. But it, it's a gift. Our government is a gift from God. God has appointed this government, such as it is, for his purposes. And we should be thankful that God has seen fit to restrain the wickedness of man through government, even if it is, even if we chafe. Because um, even as we, as we see where our, the way our government goes and the way other governments go, 
it could be so much worse. No government is, is, is awful in the, in the face of the great depravity of man. And so this is government, and the government authorities, just as much as parents, are both a punishment for sin and a blessing for the, for the furtherance of human life until Christ returns. He also blesses us with health, talents, work, family, and possessions. These are not measurements of your faith. These are not measurements of your standing before God. If you are healthy, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are in good to, on good terms with God. And if you are suffering an illness, it does not mean that you are, you are sinful. If God sees you as sin, he's being punished for sin. But good health is a blessing. Good possessions, having, you know, having your needs met, having the money you need, having a house, all the clothing, all these things are blessings. They're just not a measurement of your state before God. That's a key point to make there. Because there's a lot of people out there who will say that Every blessing of God flows from the fact that he has sent us a savior from sin. In him, all God's promises are fulfilled. In Christ Jesus, we have all we need. If we trust in him and we take, him, take to him our problems and issues, you will be surprised at the way God provides, whether regardless of what the circumstances. This doesn't mean that if we live a certain way, things will always go the way we want. Uh, no, that works. If we don't get to manipulate God into doing what we want him to do just because we think, oh, I'm living a good life. No. We don't manipulate God that way. God is not a genie that if I live a certain way, then he'll give me what I want. No, it's not how it works. That, that's not a measurement uh, of it. We just have to trust that God is going to provide for us. We throw ourselves upon the work and mercy of Jesus Christ and not trust. And we don't get to pat ourselves on the back. The minute you start patting yourself on the back, the minute you're like, oh, I need, I need to pray and say, hey, God, forgive me. I pray. My, my sin of pride, I, I have not loved you and not loved my neighbor because I just patted myself on the back, thinking that, oh, I earned this. <laughs> no, God didn't do this. Um, what does, ultimately, does God threaten against those who hate him and break his commandments? Ultimately, God threatens those who break his commandments, not only with earthly punishments, but with both physical death and eternal damnation in hell. Um, that's just a fact. There's a lot of preachers who will try to shy away from that. A lot of preachers who will sit there and try and, you know, say that that's not a fact, but it is. The scriptures don't leave us any wiggle room. There is eternal punishment for sins. There is consequences for what we do. And if we are in rebellion against God, if we are refusing to the, the forgiveness that he's given us through Jesus Christ, if we're refusing to submit ourselves and throw ourselves upon Jesus and his work and, and bend the knee to call him Lord now, and receiving his gifts of salvation and forgiveness, then there is a consequence. And it's like I said on, on um, third on Wednesday night in, our, in the sermon for Ash Wednesday, the only people who go to uh, go who end up in hell are those who refuse the gift and have brought it upon themselves. God in his good justice has deemed that all humanity is sinful and will have to submit the consequences of our sin have to be whether that's through Jesus Christ or through ourselves, our own eternal punishment. And that's just a fact. But thanks be to God, we have Jesus Christ and we can bend the knee. And we have, we, God has given us forgiveness and salvation through him. So we don't have to worry about it. We can just be thankful for it. Um, God warns children against, uh, the children of such rebellious parents so that they will not imitate their parents in hating and disobeying God, but will instead loving God, love God and keep his commands. So if your fathers, if, if our children, as children, if our parents did not serve God, that doesn't mean we can't. And God calls it, warns us against that. Like, I am not responsible for the sins of my father. I'm responsible for responding to Jesus Christ. If my father had not responded to Jesus Christ, I would still be responsible to do so. Um, and I don't want to follow in the footsteps of my father. So there's a, you see that repeatedly throughout God commanding people and the prophets. Like, don't, don't follow in the sins of your fathers. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Stop doing that. Just follow me. You don't have to. You don't have to. Just because your daddy did it doesn't mean you have to do it. Just be, if your parents were divorced and your grandparents were divorced and your great-grandparents were divorced, doesn't mean you have to get divorced. If your daddy was abusive and an alcoholic, doesn't mean you have to be. Through Jesus Christ, you can be different. You can follow Jesus. Um... How carefully does God want us to keep his commandments? He wants us to keep them perfectly in thought, word, and deed, which none of us are capable of doing. Thanks be to God that no one can be saved by keeping his commandments because we are all disobedient. The only way we can find rescue from the condemnation of God is by his merciful kindness through his only begotten son, Jesus, to rescue us from our sin 
and the condemnation we deserve. As our substitute, Jesus kept God's holy law perfectly, suffered, died, and rose again for us. Therefore, in our crucified and risen Lord Jesus, we are free from the guilt of the punishment, the power of sin, and are saved eternally. The works of the law, the whole point of this whole section, the reason the Ten Commandments are from, is to show us the law, and that the law cannot be satisfied by us, that we cannot keep the law, and that we are, that we need the gospel. <coughs> Jesus Christ is the point. We cannot, we cannot keep this law, and if anyone says they can, they've already lied. <laughs> they've already, they've been saying they've kept the law perfectly, they have failed to keep the law. <laughs> After you read Leviticus, you understand, then you thank Christ, mm -hmm. you know, for taking our sin. Oh, yeah. And the, and we, the, couldn't, we couldn't obey that. And how many of those laws were laws of, uh, because of the hardness of our hearts? Yeah. You know, when you think about it, like when, like divorce, people say, well, why does Moses let us get divorced? Well, that's for the hardness of your heart. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Like God, Moses allowed divorce because of the hardness of your heart as a measure of grace. It, it, it perfect, per, to keep you, so there are certain things in the law that you, that they're like, this is only because we know you suck. <laughs> and, and, and you, and you need that measure of grace. So, um, when you think about it, it's just, it's exhausting. I, I, I have a friend of mine, um. When I was in, I've, I spent a lot of time studying Islam in school and in, in my careers. And there were times that I could see the appeal of it. Uh, just because in, on studying it, I could see its, its attempts. And it, it, appeals to the, um, it appeals to the Adam in us, because we, the Adam in us is always looking for something to do to justify ourselves. And uh, I remember a, friend, a good friend of mine, he's a Muslim, and he said, well, why don't you just convert? Why don't you become a Muslim? I'm like, because it's exhausting. <laughs> it's exhausting to think they have to do everything perfectly when I have my Jesus who did everything for me. Why would I do that? Why? Why, why would I go try to do everything that I know I can when I have Jesus who did it for me? Like, that's an easy, that's an easy, that's easy. It is exhausting to think about trying to keep in the law because I'm capable of keeping the law. But resting in the gospel and resting in the, not the fact, the knowledge of the fact that Jesus Christ died for me and I don't have to do anything except die to myself. Sounds like a big ass, but really isn't. It, it's Bonhoeffer says Jesus bids any who would fall. I'm paraphrasing, bids that any who would follow him come and die must first come and die. Is what Bonhoeffer says about following Jesus, and that it's both the easiest and the most difficult thing to do. To constantly die to ourselves, to follow Jesus and put on Jesus, and that the weight of the law. Reminds us that we have to die, um, but that we will live. The gospel tells us that we will live again. So, any questions, thoughts, complaints, insults as we finish up the wall? One place in, in our service every day, Lutheran service, when it talks about you have to do it as an ordained member of the church, I, I declare. Our old red book used to state it. In fact, there is a condition on that forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You need to be truly sorry and humbly yeah. ask for the forgiveness. Yeah. You just don't like the kids. You see the kids as, I'm oh, sorry, Mom. I'm sorry, Mom. I'm yeah. sorry, Mom. You know, that tenth time you say, oh, you're not sorry. Now, let me give you something you're sorry about. Yeah, both of us in your old case mother and father where you've heard that before. But uh, there are conditions just like the, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. There's conditions if I forgive my sins as I forgive others. Mm -hmm. And even Sometimes then, that's hard. You know, and I think I think it's important when we consider that because that feels like work. That puts, that puts the emphasis. I think the reason, the main reason that that word verbiage was changed in the book was because by saying truly sorry, if you're true to be truly sorry and to be truly repentant, you are forgiven, your sins are forgiven. That puts the emphasis back on you. And that's not where it should be. Because then well, what because that was one of the things that drove Luther crazy when before the Reformation was was he said, I don't know if I'm truly contrite. Because the, the Catholic Church taught that in order to be forgiven, you had to be truly repentant and truly contrite when you went to confession. It didn't matter if you just said, I confess this sin. They said you had to have true contrition and true repentance. And Luther kept saying, I don't know if I have, I don't even know what that means. How do I, I don't, I don't even know if I have true repentance and true contrition. 
So when you say you have to be truly hum truly and humbly repent, when I say that, if you say that as make that a clause of the, con of the condition of forgiveness, again, it makes me start to think, it puts the stress on me. I'm like, oh crap, well, I have to, I have to be true. Now I have, to, I have work to do. I have to work and be truly humbly repent. I don't know if I'm truly humbly repentant. What I do know is that I don't want to do that. I want to follow Jesus. And so I'm throwing myself at the mercy of Christ. So if, if I'm not truly humbly repent, then I just say, God, make me truly humbly repent because I can't do it. So that, that danger, even the danger of forgiving my trespasses so that I can, as, as I forgive others, there's a problem because there's it's very Catholic theology to say there's a condition there that I have to be forgiven, I have to forgive others to be forgiven. Well, it's not so easy for us to forgive. But yeah. but God's God's but God's God's forgiveness is not contingent on my work. And so when we start to get into the territory of thinking, well, then God's forgiveness is contingent, then we're right back in the law. The gospel says none of my work brings about forgiveness. So Yes, I should forgive others as I have been forgiven. Yes, I should be contrite and truly repentant when I confess my sins. But the only way that's going to happen is through the growth of faith in, my, in me, through the preaching of the word and the receiving of the sacrament. I don't know that I will ever perfectly forgive certain people. I beg God to help me, make, help me forgive them. But I don't know that I'll ever perfectly forgive them. I don't know if there's certain things that I'll ever perfectly repent of. I beg God to make me repentant and help me turn and change me, what change my ways and bring me away from those temptations. But I do know that by throwing myself on the mercies of Jesus Christ, totally and completely, that I'm forgiven. Not through my work. It doesn't depend on me. It depends on Christ. And Christ accomplished it. So with that, you know, that you have to be careful with that language. When you start to say that grace is contingent. Because then you're right back in, you're right back pre-reformation. You're right back in law. You're right back in works. Because <laughs> that's a work. <laughs> and we don't do that here. <laughs> if, if any good works come from me, it comes from Jesus in me. If I am a good pastor, it's not because of me. If I have a good sermon, believe me, that's how I know I did nothing. <laughs> if I have a good sermon, if you got a lot out of it, that had nothing to do with me. <laughs> that had everything to do with the Spirit, not me. Because I don't get to pat myself on the back. If I love my wife well, it has nothing to do with me because I'm a very selfish and arrogant person. <laughs> and it's just a fact. And God is fixing that in me. And has forgiven that in me. If I love my wife well, it's because Christ is loving my wife well through me. So if I am truly contrite, if I am truly repentant, if I am truly forgiving others, it is not me who is doing it, it's Christ who is doing it. <clears throat> and that, again, it's, it's, it goes back to that analogy of I'm drowning, and I have to let the lifeguard drag me to shore. I can't save myself. I have to let the lifeguard do the work. Because if I start fighting him, we both drown. And in this case, Christ can't drown. So if I start fighting him and try to do it myself, I drown. But if I just relax and I say, you know what, God, I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe what you say. And because I believe what you say, I'm throwing myself on you and receiving your gifts. Then He'll do the work. He'll do the work. You mentioned in the Lord that kind of tempted you sometimes when you were praying. You said, Lord, I believe you forgive me. And he said, not again. No. <laughs> I don't think that at all. Parents do that way. Parents do, because we're not perfect. But I don't think I don't think for a minute God ever said it's not again. I think God says, Absolutely. Absolutely. Why? Because I am merciful and forgiving. What is that? Oh, let me see if I can find it real quick. What is that passage in Exodus? Yes, that's exactly the first thing. Slow and anger and abounding in steadfast love. I need to memorize. I'm terrible at memorizing. Yeah, yeah, okay. um, when you look at that, 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 that verse, when he says that, that is, I mean, he's absolutely slow to anger. That's it's absolutely, that's who he is. He, he, he wants to forgive. God wants to forgive us. <laughs> so much so. That he came down, became a human being, suffered de death, and was buried, and rose again on the third day. Like he wants it so bad that so when we come and say, "God forgive me," he the, the story of the prodigal son is not a story of an unbeliever who comes to faith. It's the story of a believer who left the faith and came back. Every time we sin, 
we leave, and then every time we repent, we come back, and God the Father welcomes us with open arms and celebrates with a party. Every time we repent, there is no, oh, again, you know, no, he says, I'm so glad you're home. Come home. Come home. Let's, let's have a party. He throws the robe of Christ's righteousness over our shoulders. He says, you're covered. Everything. Not because of anything we did, just because we came back to Christ. We didn't have trouble with understanding that, because we can't do it. It's a mystery. <laughs> it's a divine mystery. We don't understand, we don't understand it any more than we understand anything else in the <laughs> we, we, we will never understand it fully. It doesn't make sense to us because we're sinful. Yes, sir. You said a lot of good things since you've been in this church. One thing that sticks out to me more than anything else, you told us in Sunday school, and it's about life and love. <clears throat> and you know, when we, we get jumped in the lake, we'll throw a life preserver out in case we need it. Mm -hmm. We're always reaching for it. But you said, put that life preserver on. Buckle the strap. Can't sink. No. You, can I, you can relax. The analogy I think about it with. Suck the fleet, suck the oh yeah, and, and you know, to, to further explain the analogy is, is I think about it when you, you know the old car, the old stories and cartoons when they have the, the, the ship has the life preserver with the name on it in the circle and it's attached to a rope and they throw that out so there's no buckles. You just you receive it, you put it on, and then you then they drag you in. That's that's the version I think of. Because it's just like, you just, you just hang there. <laughs> you just hang there. And it's like like, uh, like goose on Top Gun getting dragged up to the chopper when they try to pull him out. He's, you can tell he's dead, but they pull, they pull him out. That's us, just laying there, completely dead in our sin, and God pulls himself <clears> to <throat> to salvation and life. And that's just it's so beautiful. It's, it's so relaxing to think, oh, wow. Wait, what? <laughs> It's, it's, it's hard to believe, and our, our flesh tries to work against it. Adam keeps wanting to, oh, I have to justify myself. I, I, I'm, I'm a good person. He's an awful person, but I'm a good person. Adam, the flesh constantly does that until the day of our death, until and, and we're free of it until the resurrection. And then Adam's gone in the resurrection, and we, get, we are finally free. And it's a wonderful thing to do. Any other questions, thoughts? All right, let's go ahead and pray and get y'all out of here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for the law you've given us and made it how abundantly clear you have made it to us what we must do to satisfy your justice and your righteousness. And we thank you so much that you saw us unable to complete that so that you sent your son to die for us so that we could, so that he could take the punishment for our breaking the law and satisfy your judgment that we might enter into righteousness and eternal life through him. Lord, we feel the weight of your law, and even as the psalmist cries out, we thank you for the, son, the salvation we have in Jesus Christ that allows us to rejoice in your law, to look at this and say, yes, that's a good thing. Even if we are unable to keep it, we recognize it as a good thing. We thank you so much for your salvation, for your forgiveness, for the fact that you tirelessly forgive us. And we ask that you continue to do so, that you continue to stir up in us faith, that you continue us to equip us with your spirit so that it will bear the spirit he will bear fruit in us uh, in the form of good works not works for our salvation not works that are coming from us but works that are coming from you within us I ask that you give each of us a safe trip home tonight that you give us a good week and opportunities to bless you and praise you and share you with our neighbors I ask that you give us a good rest as well we ask all this in the name of jesus christ who with you and the holy spirit is worshiped and glorified one god forever and ever